Oh, now we get the comfy chairs, huh? I think so. Okay. I think we're also going to take questions from the audience, so if you have any, any objectives and pushback or comments, positive ones only, of course. Do you have anyone to start us off? If not, I've got a question for you, Gerd. Anyone want to begin? Yes, a little girl at the front. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say is, um, first of all, is that mainly we shouldn't try to make robots that are like us because of cybers and hackers. And we should try to make other people who might not be able to code help them to code. All right, thank you. Yeah. That's a great comment. I totally agree with you. <laughs> you know, I always say we should, um, we should make robots that help us to be more human. And we should not make them more human so that they can replace us. You know, of course, that's a fine line as to how exactly that would happen, clearly. Thank you. One of the things that we can learn from you is uh, how actually we need to interact at all levels. And the, we talk about diversity, and I, I just want to applaud a little girl at coming in to talk to us about that important subject of humanist behavior within this world of technology. And I think we all need to think about it from that perspective. Uh, and I know that I've got some of my youngest and brightest in the room here, and I think they are the ones that are changing our thinking faster than anyone else. So thank you for the question. Hello, hello. Um, so, where are you? I'm, I'm over here. Okay. So, um, kind of growing up and having various conversations with my friends as teenagers, uh, the idea of having microchips in your brain was kind of the conspiratorial line that everyone decided that, like, okay, that would be too far, irrelevant of the opinions. Mm -hmm. So, considering this is the first time that I've heard someone speak about um, Elon Musk and the Neuralink with the edge that it isn't a definite thing we should run into, what do you think it is about either the presentation of it or the timing that it's come that seems to kind of haze that obvious opinion that it shouldn't necessarily be something that we jump straight into or that it's more than just about regulators saying whether it's safe enough in, safe enough um, in terms of like the idea of mass adoption and its potential if everybody did adopt it in mass. Yeah, I have a lot of concerns about this. I think that you know, it's one thing if you're sick and you, you can use technology to get well or to get over it. So if I lose both legs, I can get prosthesis. You know, that's one thing. But it's another thing to say I'm going to use the same technology to become superhuman because I have a lot of money. And then I'm going to sell that technology because I have more money, right? And then after I've sold it enough, I'm going to leave the planet mm. because the planet is messed up, right? I mean, that is some bizarre logic. Right. You know that most people in Silicon Valley are now having, buying houses in New Zealand just in case everything goes south in America, they can take their jets and go to New Zealand and live a sheltered life. You know, so basically a lot of these things are building a world that they will not actually live in, mm. right? Like Zuckerberg owns the entire block on, on uh, what is it, Broadway uh, in San Francisco. He bought one house, then he bought a few other houses. Now he owns the whole block. And the argument for buying all the other houses which are empty was that he wants his privacy, right? So he wants his privacy with the other houses, but we don't get any of that on Facebook. You know, we get, we get the digital jail, you know. So, yeah, I think I agree with you. This is a complicated truth because we, we don't want to pull out the baby with the bathwater, you know. Um, but somehow we have to decide on the limits, and we have to decide on what's fair. And currently we have done pretty much whatever we can just because it was technically possible. So one thing that I've learned working with some of the startups, that these innovators and entrepreneurs, once they've got hooked on the idea of entrepreneurialism, they want to do more. And the more that they grab, the more they want to give. So there is a little bit of, you can see that in Elon Musk and some of the other entrepreneurs, they don't so, sort of stop at the small goals, they go for bigger ones. So I think we need to embrace those bigger goals that they may bring to us and then go with them. Yeah, I think this is a, you know, it depends on where you are in the exponential scale. You know? if, if you're in the beginning of the scale, like I, I was with my internet companies in the 90s, you know, 
we were at the very beginning of the, of the exponential curve, mm. and we were doubling 0 0.01 to 0 0.02, 0 0.04. It was still all useless, basically, mm. right? It didn't work. But when you're at 4, you leap to 8, 16, 32. I go 30 steps from here to the wall, or 30 steps exponential, I'm on the moon, right? So when I, when I live in an exponential world like we do today, the scale is just so much bigger. Hmm. So if Elon is saying that we're all going to have these interfaces, then he should think about what the consequence of that is. Right? I mean, never mind that it may be good, or I don't know, but, but I have my judgments, I mean, my, my, my reservations about that being a solution to the human problem. That sounds like a giant business opportunity to me. So maybe the regulation comes by people being close to the technology and understanding how to apply it other ways. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not generally of, in favor of, regu of regulation. I mean, I, I ran startups. I know, I live in Switzerland. I know how hard it is when you have too much regulation. Mm. <laughs> you know, but I'm only concerned about remaining human. And if we want to remain human, we have to protect what makes us human. Right? Otherwise, we can sell that out. Yes. And then we, you know, we will be very soon, we'll be at the black mirror place, you know, where we can mm. say, yeah, you know, we are very functional, you know. Good, thank you very much. Uh, I come from the business community and, and to you, Paul. Um, I, uh, listen, you asked some massive, massive questions there, which got me, uh, got, I'm sure, and everybody here thinking hard. The, um, some of the big, uh, one of the big questions that comes to me is, and, and Paul, you referred to it in your presentation about business being seen as the solution, not as the problem around, if you talk about climate change, you always talk about I think the other danger you outlined was around technology and how that can be poisonous, as it were. Um, do you think that the, the responsibility lies with whom? Is it with the larger businesses? Is it with uh, you know, civil society, you know, government, governments, national governments? Where, where do you think the solution is? Because there are lots of I, you know, problems and challenges you've thrown out there, but where do you see the, the route to, to, to solutions? Yeah, I think, you know, first, we, we have a lot of the tools that we need already. Like, we can solve climate change and energy and water and food with technology, right? I mean, and that is imminent, you know? But technology will not solve social, political, or cultural problems, and one of them is inequality, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so on the one hand, we have all these powerful tools. We could solve pretty much almost everything in the next 20 years. And on the other hand, we don't, we don't agree on any of it, right? So, so we, we have all the power here, and then the, the money power is concentrated now. Basically, for the first time ever, the top 50 billionaires in the U.S. have gained like 800% of, of money uh, in the last 10 years. So we have that all on one place. So it comes down to will and decision-making and wisdom and collaboration to use the tools. Right? That's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. The tools are good. Right? So my view is that it's all there, we just have to do the right thing with it. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the, the business question for me is that if a company really has a sense of purpose and acts in the way that their purpose is set, it goes back to some of Gerd's points. I think it, it, it creates this more sustainable future for the business. And well, certainly I mean, clearly today, if you, if you pack your business and you, you map your business to the new world, right, which is the, the uh, quadruple bottom line, right, in five years, this will be the new normal. Mm -hmm. right? Like today, if you don't care about all of those things, you can still make money today. Facebook does, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook makes $165 million profit a day. Mm -hmm. And none of these principles are part of Facebook. Right? In five years, that will not happen. Mm -hmm. So if you're a startup and you, you're going into business, if you're doing something in the airline industry, you're going to have to figure out how to use other fuels. Right. right? And, and, and the, to the point that we look at this beautiful aircraft, we know it's one of the most polluting aircraft the world has ever seen. So we know there's other supersonic aircraft on the blocks, and we're beginning to question ourselves, do we ever want to be helping someone build that aircraft? If our principle is a sustainable future for the generations to come, that's what's going to give us growth, not by building 14 of these. So we're going to have to make some hard decisions. Yeah, I mean, it's quite clear that you know, you're looking at the next 10 years, I mean, the next five years, we're going to see dramatic mm. measures on, on CO2 and climate change. So mandatory carbon tax for airplanes, yep. mandatory reduction of, of uh, cattle, uh, 
no more binge flying and what I'm doing, right, that will be essentially also off the table. You'll join me on the train. <laughs> right, yes, I'll come along on the train. Or maybe I'll just go virtual, I don't know. But, uh, and, and no cars and cities. I mean, we're going to see stuff that's basically totally anti-capitalist, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's not, this is not the free market we're talking about here, when the farmers have to reduce their livestock by 50%. You know? But these are going to be emergency measures. Right? And on the positive side, some people are saying we're going to have 100 million new jobs on sustainable energy. Mm -hmm. 100 million. Right? I mean, think about all the tech that we're going to need for this. Right? CO2, uh, CO2 uh, decarbonization. Absolutely. And all, I mean, there's yeah, loads and loads and loads of opportunities. Right? Yeah. For goods, right? I, I worked in a little company called Rolls Royce, produced these engines. In fact, was on the board of the, the joint venture with Snecma. And we came up with ideas that we took to our board and said, we could make something far better than these engines of today. We could put hydrogen in them, we could put other fuels. But actually, we've got a whole business that's producing kerosene burning engines. Do we want to do that just now and kill our business? That's a conundrum. And I think that's the, the obligation is now on us to question ourselves. And, and that's a difficult place to be. But, but you know, this usually doesn't happen inside of an industry. Mm -hmm. You know, Spotify came out of left field uh, using the music like water idea. It was partly outlined in my first book in 2004. And the record label said, this is terrible, a terrible idea. Now, music like water, we hate this idea because music is going to be cheap. We don't want music to be expensive, right? And what do we have now? Does anybody in this room still buy CDs? You know, it, there's a whole new music business. Yeah? And the same thing is going to happen with energy, with food, with climate. Right? We're, we're going to invent our way out, but we do have to have the political and the cultural intent you know, to actually make it work. You know? And you need to build a coalition around that of people that you, know, you, you, you talk I mean, look what's happening in the US now. Right? After Trump, we have uh, Senator Warren, Elizabeth Warren, coming up with this audacious plan for for health care for everyone and climate change. And I mean, this is like night and day. Here's the really like the evil guy in the, over, over there. It's like, wow, you know, I think it can be done. But it takes a different paradigm, a different <coughs> thinking. And, and I, I imagine a world where the young girl and, and my kids can fly and a plane that produces water out the back uh, rather than kerosene burning CO2 noxious gases. Yeah, that's why I'm not so much for regulating too much. I just want to regulate the most important thing, which is that we can stay human. Right? I don't want companies to take that away from us because they can make money with it. Exactly. You know, I don't want companies to, to destroy democracy because they can sell ads. You know? And that sounds like a stupid idea. You know? uh, and I would like people to spend more time on figuring out how to make it better for us mm. than to make it better for you know, some corporate ownership. I think we had a question over there. Yes, thank you. First of all, an amazing day, an amazing keynote speech to finish. Um, I too come from the business community and it's brilliant to take a day out in Bristol with our peers to think about really strategic issues and not the usual topics that, that we're faced with uh, over the last three years. So thank you, it's been inspirational. My question plays to the inequality uh, piece that you've touched on, Gerd. I was brought up in Northern Ireland through the height of the Troubles. Um, it was a highly polarized, divisive community. My biggest fear, and I see this growing exponentially in the world, is that divisive, polarized behavior is becoming endemic across the world. And obviously a lot of what we've looked at today can be looked at through a very negative land, lens. I look back to the likes of the work that Nelson Mandela did in South Africa and the wonderful story. Unfortunately for England, you didn't get your wonderful story, but it's a brilliant story for South Africa to have their first black captain given where he came from and his childhood and how there can be positive change in the world. Where do you, Gerd, see light happening in terms of the ability of defeating this polarized, toxic, them and us world that if they get hold of technology, there's only one outcome. <laughs> yes. Well, I would say right now it probably has to get worse before it gets better. Like, you know, this is how we're, this is how we're gonna address climate change because now we're actually saying, it's actually real, you know, I can, I can feel it. And it's, I mean, now we can, we can touch it, right? I mean, it's hard to touch stuff that's 50 years away, right? 
So that is happening now, and I think we've seen in all the countries that have voted right-wing governments, right, that essentially hasn't worked out at all. Right? It's none of that has made anything better. Right? Like, uh, and, and especially a temporary situation, I think in five years, we're going to have this new renaissance. You know, that's going to come to conclusion saying, okay, we want a good quality life and we have to do certain things for that. Right? Uh, and, you know, maybe in the U.S. we'll see that swing even earlier now in that whole discussion. Who knows? But, yeah, usually uh, people only change for two reasons, right? Uh, pain and love. Mm. Right? That's how governments change. That's how people change. That's how companies change. You have enough pain, you say, oh, what the hell, you know, I'll try something else. Right? Or you fall in love with an idea or a person, of course. Right? And I think that's happening right now. People are saying, you know what, I think the pain is getting quite clear. Brexit also. Right? And I fall in love with new ideas. Mm. And then we can come up with new things. And this is how we change. Right? So just building on that and going back to the analogy for sport for a moment, I was watching the World Club uh, final and Johnny Wilkinson did a bit of uh, his great thinking in front of uh, the audience. And he said, we really need to see some innovation. We need to do different stuff. We need to be leaders and go to different places we've never done before. And doing that difficult stuff, I think, is what we're into. And taking Gerd's point on board, I think this is the time where either people break into polarization or they actually use that to come together. And I think we'll find, and certainly against the background of the sustainable aviation world, we're going to come together. Well, let's go back to the, what I said in the beginning, right? The future is better than we think. Yep. Yeah. And this is not all bad. What's happening right now is we, we will have incredible power of technology to help solve almost every problem. Right? Exactly. But we have to use it correctly. So it's not like we don't have the tools. I mean, if we didn't have the tools, that would be bad. Mm -hmm. right? And we, we have the tools to have a completely green energy. Right? We just have to make the right decisions. Right. Yeah? And so that's what it comes down to. This is a process of, of democracy and stuff. It's not a process of lack of science. You know, we have all the science. Right? So when you look at it from that point of view, the only obstacle is, our, is us. Mm. It's not that we don't have the tools. We have all the tools. Right? And there's loads of business. I mean, again, compare the music business, right? $40 billion worth of CDs sold. Average uh, cost of CD, 15 pounds or so, right? Today, we have Spotify and other services. 120 million subscribers for roughly 10 quid a month, right? If that continues, that trend, the music industry will be $100 billion, right? So first, it all caved in and it went away pretty much, right? And it's come back into And it. now it's going to, I think it's going to be the same with energy, with healthcare, with banking, with food, with water, right? We just have to put it in a place to where it can flourish. That's it then. <laughs> Waving us off. Okay, good. Well, well, there's one last question. Could we just take that one and then close? Well, By the way, you know, my, my book is available in 12 oh. languages. You know, Hello? If, oh. if you should speak German or Chinese, you can buy it there as well. Hi, I have a question. Where um, are you? Right sorry, I'm here. There. Okay. Um, I love everything you're saying, and you often use the word we, but who do you mean by we? Who takes leadership in delivering what you're saying in a global society and a global ec economic system? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I think when I say we, I usually speak about humans, you know, uh, people who want to remain humans. I mean, the question of we is always the kind of thing where we're saying, okay, what do we have in common? I think we have a lot more in common than we think. You know, every time I speak somewhere in China or South America or the U.S., I realize that, you know, 99.9% .9 of people want to be human. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they want things that everybody else wants. Right? There are lots of difference in how they want it, right? Um, and the other question of we is really that, you know, we've done a very bad job of telling the story about the future ourselves. Mm. We have left that to the technology companies. You know, if you talk about, you know, who talks about the future? Silicon Valley and China. Mm. Do we talk about the future? Yeah, we talk about the future and researchers and those kind of things, yes. Like in Switzerland, we do that a lot, right? But the PR behind the future is not ours. Right? It's not the human, it's the tech part, right? Yeah. So th on the point of we, I think we have to take that back. Uh, we have to tell more stories. We have to come on the same page. And I also think that probably, um, I'm writing a new book on this, 
in 20 years we're going to have a world government, right? Because how are we going to get on the same page? You know, if Brazil burns down the entire Amazon, that will be bad for the UK. Right? Does it mean we should send soldiers there and you know, prevent Bolsonaro from doing that? Well, that's, I don't know, you know, difficult question. But we're going to have a, a global situation that solves food, water, energy, and all these things like we're kind of edging towards this concept of collaborating. Hmm? I just answer it from my perspective. The we is in this room. Uh, uh, I personally take on risk in my business on a daily basis. And um, for the example on hydrogen, it wasn't a discussion in the business two years ago when I joined. The CEO stood on platforms talking about what we've taught him uh, most recently with economic leaders, and we're starting to broadcast from within the organization the benefits. So if we can believe it and show and demonstrate the technologies there, it will happen. Uh, we just got to keep the momentum and build the creation together with other people. This is also one of those things, you know, where we hear so many bad stories in the media that we don't have a we, but we do. Right? We also hear so many stories about how the future is bad, right? Mm. I mean, every single movie you watch, the future ends badly, we all die, right? Mm. That, that's what movies are all about now, right? I mean, the only movie that I can remember was like Blade Runner, okay, that ended not as bad, but left everything hanging, not the last one, the first one, the good one, you know. Mm. But, or Her, right, the movie Her, where I can say that's a movie where I can, you know, understand more. But anyway, we have to get off the story of saying it's bad and it's, I can't do anything and the future's happening without me and all this stuff, you know, this is like, it's fatalistic, mm. right? So I think with that optimistic note, I guess that's the last question we've got time for. But I'm sure Gerd and I will be around just for a few more moments and, uh, and thank you all for your time today. I see. Thank you, Gerd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.